Welcome to Psychology Matters. This is our first episode of what we hope to be very educational and informative about mental health and the different professions or licenses within the profession. And I'm so happy I get to have two wonderful people here today, two licensed professionals. We have Clay Harris. Welcome, Clay. It's Thank good you. to have you here. And welcome, Dr. Susan Leahy. Thank it's you. It's great to have you. And I'm Diane Bradley. Um, some people call me Diane if you're a client. Students call me Dr. Diane Bradley, and I think you have students that call you Dr. Leahy. That's right. That's and we right. know you as good old Clay, <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> so it's so good to have you, and we get to talk about the different kinds of licenses. I think it's a confusing thing for, you know, just the general public, you know, to know what it is that we do, the fact that there's different kinds of mental health professionals, different kinds of licenses. Um, we have some very similar things that we do, and yet there's some little nuances that are different. And so we thought that this would be a good time at the very beginning to start talking about the differences and the similarities. Mm -hmm. So Clay, you're a licensed professional counselor. That's right. Right? That's right. Well, Susan, if that's okay to call yes, you Susan. Yes, absolutely. You're a licensed marriage and family therapist. That's right and that happens to be the license that I have as well. So I'm going to be very intrigued to hear about the differences and similarities. I think I know some of those, but we get to share that with the public, you know, those, those unique features with the LPC. Sure. So first of all, let's see, you work with the Mental Health Cooperative as a program manager, right? That's right. Okay, so what is the Mental Health Cooperative? Mental Health Cooperative serves uh, Middle Tennessee mm -hmm. and we primarily um, support the SPMI population which stands for severe and persistently mentally ill Okay. and although we do serve other clients um, that is our primary population that we serve um, and we have approximately 10 locations for outpatient services uh, where we have um, professional counselors in each one of those locations providing therapy and then we also have therapists uh, in the schools uh, as well as pediatric locations. Um, so so we if you're a program manager, you've got people like you, licensed people, pre-licensed people? Yes. Serving? Um, okay. So as a program manager, I provide supervision to um, all the therapists that are in our outpatient locations and um, some are fully licensed and some are working towards their licensure um, and so my supervision varies depending on uh, where they are in that process and mm -hmm. so for those who are working towards their licensure um, I'm on a set schedule meeting with them trying to help them uh, achieve those necessary hours to um, obtain their license and then for those who are already licensed or maybe seasons, seasoned, um, then we meet on an as-needed basis or okay. periodically, or we may even talk by phone and, and those kind of things. So, so it just varies. kind of a natural progression, right. you know, what they need. Right. So I would imagine that's a lot of people that your therapist, your counselors, and you are serving Absolutely. in Middle Tennessee, right? Each therapist has approximately um, 150 clients on their caseload. Each one has that many? Wow, that's a lot. It and is. so how do they find you? Do they walk in off the street? How do they find you? Um, there really are a number of different ways. Their um, medical providers may refer them. Uh, friends or family um, may pro provide them with, with referral information um, because we, we do and can serve and treat an entire family. So we may be working with a grandmother and uh, their grandchildren and, and everybody in between and, and family members and things like that. And we have wow. locations not only in uh, Nashville, uh, but also the surrounding counties. And so sometimes we may be serving a whole family in, in a rural setting uh, where wow. there is often limited um, access to mental health. So let's say I have a situation and I want to bring in my child um, that needs these kinds of services, okay? So how would I do that? Would I call someone and make an appointment? 
Do I need insurance in order to get in? Do you take insurance? How would I know how to get in? Sure, it's a great question. Um, for our agency, we serve uh, those on TennCare, mm -hmm. and so um, w the individual would contact our intake department, and our intake department would walk them through that initial process of verifying the insurance and telling them if they're able to qualify for those services and kind of make that a very easy transition where sometimes when individuals think about accessing services, it could be overwhelming. Um, oh, and yeah, so they and anxiety provoking absolutely that, so yeah. they just avoid it altogether mm -hmm. uh, but it's really become a, a very smooth system in that process of, of the intake department helping them get connected and setting up all the appointments and so, so I don't have to feel weird about calling in you know, I'm gonna be treated well you're gonna walk me through the process how to get in to see a counselor or to have my child see a counselor absolutely um, it would be very similar to what you would do to go and see your medical provider. Okay, okay. That's, I never knew that. That's good to know. I've had some ideas about it, but I didn't know that. Well, I'm going to shift a little bit over here, shift over to Susan. Sure. You have a very different situation than that. I do. As a marriage and family therapist. So you're in private practice. That's right. Correct? And you're also a professor mm -hmm. at local university. Rebecca Nazarene University. That's right. And head up the doctoral program there, right? Yes, so I, I wear multiple hats. Yeah. I, I'm in multiple roles. So I'm an educator, but I'm also a supervisor for people that want to be licensed marriage and family therapists. And I'm also. Oh, common. That's <laughs> right, right. That's right. right. And I'm also a practicing marriage and family therapist. So, and, and, and I actually teach people that have or want to have his license as well. Okay. So we probably could talk about that at some point. Oh, yeah. um, but the, the marriage and family therapy side is a little bit different than the counseling side. I, I don't know if you want me to talk more about myself now or? Sure, Okay. because there are, there are those differences and I think it has to do with approach. Am sure, I right? okay. sure. Well, I was thinking as, as Clay was talking, um, you sometimes families come but I'm wondering, you probably see them individually, not necessarily as a family. There, there are, um, even if they come in as a family, they're mm -hmm. still identified as, a, as an individual client. Right, um, right. Probably so somewhat person directed is an by individual. insurance and those mm -hmm. kind of things. Right. Um, at some point, there may be collaboration where mm -hmm. Uh, it's treated as a family system, but okay. it, initially everybody comes in as an individual client. Okay, which is a lot different right. maybe from the, your angle, right? Well, and he said some key language. Uh, someone that has a license or working towards a license as a marriage and family therapist does prefer to, it's not always possible, but prefers to work with the whole family system mm -hmm. rather than just different parts of the family system. Although, if I am working with just one person, I still have a perspective that looks at the whole family. So it's like the whole family is in the room, even though they're literally not in the room. It, at at right. times, right? Okay. I, I think my preference is to have as many people in the room as possible, mm -hmm. but that's not always an option. And so what you might find, I think Clay's environment is more a community-based is that the right language, sure, community-based, yes. where a lot of marriage and family therapists are gonna be in a more of a private setting. Some might bill and take insurance where some may not um, because they have a desire to work with more than one person at a time. And sometimes agency type settings don't allow for that. Okay, so I wanna say this again. I wanna make sure that our viewers get to understand. Mm -hmm. So our license, we have the same license, it's licensed marriage and family therapist. And yet we still work with individuals. We sure. don't only work with marriage and families. However, we're considering that entire system, it's systemic That's right. in nature. Is That's that, right. Is well, that, you know, what's interesting, you know, every state has license laws and codes that tell people that help people. So if you seek services, you can know that the people that are gonna help you are, are doing a good job and even if they're not, there's ways to tell on them in essence. So right. you can make sure that you're getting good counseling. Right. 
ultimately what a licensed professional counselor and a licensed marriage and family therapist would do can look actually kind of similar. Yeah. Um, the differences, and, and this comes across when I teach, the differences are more philosophy. Right. So how, right. If, a, if a client comes to my office and presents with a specific issue, I might view it or intervene differently mm -hmm. than an LPC. So my training is to look at the entire family system, that it's not just one person mm -hmm. that's struggling, it's how is this circumstance, this issue, whatever the person comes in with, is impacting the entire family. And like you said earlier, whether they're in the room or not, I tend to be considering right. everybody in the system right. rather than just the presenting issue. Okay, so I think we can have some fun here. Okay. We'll take a case and like <laughs> have you guys, you know, like a scenario, like mm. this is probably what I would do. This is, this is an idea, an approach I would take. First though, you heard her talk about that system and the systemic approach, regardless of whether the family is literally or the couple is literally in the office or not, there's that consideration sure. for them. So your approach, though, is a little bit different. Am I, am I correct in thinking that it's a little bit more medical model based and looking at symptoms and matching up what you do to take care of whatever it is that you assess and decide that you need to work on? Help, think, me, help me explain that. I think that's a great uh, way of conceptualizing that mm -hmm. and thinking about it. Um, oftentimes we're going to be able to look at that diagnosis or evaluate a potential diagnosis um, and that may guide our treatment uh, based on what that may be. Um, and so uh, oftentimes for a lot of the individuals that we work with, um, there may be uh, three family members and they may all have their own individual things that they're struggling with so we mm -hmm. may spend that time initially uh, developing that those interventions for them on an individual basis right. but then recognizing because I come from a systems background mm -hmm. um, recognizing at some point once we've gotten some of those things under control or maybe manageable uh, or they're feeling more comfortable uh, with being able to handle some of their own things, then we mm -hmm. may begin to eventually also look at the family system as well mm -hmm. once they've been able to kind of manage those initial things for themselves. I don't know about you, Susan, but I have found myself, I have actually referred a client yeah. in a, from a family to an LPC to work That's with right. individually. That's have right. you done that as well? Before? I have done that, and, and it's interesting. I'm sitting here thinking, and this is the educator in me coming out, um, and, and it'd probably be helpful for the audience to recognize that there isn't a better way to do therapy mm -hmm. or provide counseling. It's just different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think all counselors try to meet the need of the person that's with them. So whether it's an LPC or a LMFT, mm -hmm. you're going to get a, a different experience in counseling, but there's really not a better, best Right. At all. Right. They're, they're really just different. That, that really makes me think about, ultimately, the statistics have been, the research has been done in that area That's about right. what the research says is the most effective uh, approach towards treatment mm -hmm. or helping other people. And It's not the answer. The, the research says what? It's about the relationship. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, That's right. I'm glad so. we all know that part. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, important. So, so, so people can come to us yeah. and know 100% unless... Maybe not someone pro providing the best services, but a solid counselor, they're going to feel safe, secure, connected. Mm -hmm. So that's really good for, I think, the general public to know and our viewers to know that, you know, that therapeutic relationship is important. So being able to be authentic with your counselor, your therapist, being able to be open, be feeling comfortable is important. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the biggest agent toward therapeutic success, right? That's right. So it's good that we know that. Well, and as Clay talked about, multiple individuals are the client. If, if at all possible, and it's not always the best case, but when someone comes to me, what tends to happen is the family is my client, mm -hmm. not just individuals in the family. I'm not going to work with 
multiple people in the family all separately. Right. My client would be the family. Right. So if a presenting issue was, say, a, a child was having some issues at school, um, the, the goal for counseling wouldn't be the child's issues if the family is my client. So if the family is my client, the goals would be the family's functioning, how the family rallies to handle the presenting issue. So I'm going to set goals really pretty differently, yet interestingly, we're ultimately going to likely get to the same place. Um, sometimes people have a choice of who they see, sometimes they really don't. Right, right. So, well, let's just pick up what you're talking okay. about because that's the scenario that I was going to present okay. for both of you. Let's say, and it's not so very different than some, maybe someone that I've worked with or any of us have worked with. Let's say we have a single mother with a teenager, and let's say he's 15, and he's had behavior problems at school, and he's been told he needs to get some help. He's just not getting it. And we may even hear that word ADD, attention deficit disorder, okay? The mom is frustrated. Mom needs some help. He's isolating at home. In other words, he's not doing a whole lot to connect with his siblings or his mother. He eats in his room alone. He doesn't want to be bothered. He may have video games maybe that he spends a lot of hours on. And now, hear this mom has brought in this 15-year-old son. I don't know what to do with him. Okay, so let's go over here to Clay first. Let's see what. It's like, I get to go first. Yes, <laughs> and we'll just pretend that we're your. But it's not an indication of better. Well, no, yeah. it's, it's an indication of trying to figure it out first before you get to. We'll just like we're your supervisees, and you're demonstrating maybe mm -hmm. for us, or you're telling us how you would handle a case like this. So this mom has brought the 15-year-old in, Joe. Joe's a problem. Joe doesn't like to talk. You know, how would you approach a case like that? Originally, if, if I was giving that information, um, I think the first thing I would try to do, especially in this case, but probably in most cases, is that engagement phase and information gathering. Mm -hmm. And so, um, depending on their relationship and how they presented, it's possible that I could go through that process with them together. But probably unlikely at this point, based on the presentation, that he's isolated and um, kind of staying to himself, and there may be a disconnect between them at this point right. in time. And so, more than likely, I would probably try to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with him, mm -hmm. um, and and kind of like, what's going on, buddy? You know? Yeah, just kind of yeah. trying to better understand who he is, um, likes, dislikes, uh, what he interprets to be the problem or the way he sees things, trying to just get, get some understanding of, of his view of what's going on and why he's here and those kind of things and really just hopefully um, allowing him the opportunity to give his version of what everybody else is going to give their version of mm -hmm. and um, allowing him to have that opportunity to just present his case and himself uh, in whatever way he sees that. Okay. Um, and then I think. And then I, would you tell the mom what you talked about because she's the worried one here? Would you then share that information with her? It depends. I mean, we would obviously talk about uh, confidentiality. That's an important piece right. in therapy and counseling. Um, and so, what I would what I would say in general is that 15-year-old um, boys probably don't want their therapist going back and telling their mom everything they said in counseling. Mm -hmm as a general rule. Um, so for the most part, I, I typically tell the parents that um, unless there's something that, that is th said that's significant, um, then uh, outside of there being a risk of safe safety or self-harm or mm -hmm. something like yeah. that, um, then we'll probably keep those things confidential. If there is something that I feel is a significant piece that needs to be discussed, then that would be something that I would bring to you as a parent or I would tell the kiddo that that's when I would talk to mom about uh, what we've talked about but otherwise it would stay between that's us. That's one of those, um, the less I have to tell you the better. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So if I'm not telling you anything, we're working along. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the approach that you would start with at that least. Would, that would just be the initial piece. Okay. So 
So now I'll shift over here to the systemic perspective. Now what would you do? Well, what's interesting, I, I actually tend to, and, and not all marriage and family therapists follow this model. A lot of them do. I'd actually probably set up a meeting with the parent or parents first. Mm -hmm. And and there's a, a couple reasons in there. One, I'm, I'm really trying to find out, is this client a good candidate for family therapy? And I, I don't necessarily want to develop a connection with a a young child or a young client, if maybe the, the mom comes in and I realize her stress is pretty high and and maybe the the teen or child doesn't need counseling right now. We, without getting too technical, sometimes we talk about what sometimes is the presenting issue isn't always really what's going on. So I, I tend to meet with the parent first and if, if the client is a good candidate, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite everybody in. So okay. let's say we have the 15-year-old, but then there's a 13-year-old sibling. Um, maybe there's a 5-year-old sibling. I may or may not invite that right. young child in right. first off, but right. I want everyone to come in. Right. And, and what's interesting from my perspective, sometimes that's where issues emerge. Right. Oh, yeah. so, so let's say mom comes in and there's a dad and I ask where dad is. Well, he doesn't want to be a part of this. He just thinks the child needs to get over it then I realize if I invite the family in, I'm already surfacing something else that's going on. Mm -hmm. So we're not ignoring the fact that the 15-year-old the Joe is struggling, but we recognize from a marriage and family perspective that the whole family somehow plays a part. Right. And um, I tell parents, this is, you, this is a, a safe zone where it's nobody's fault that everybody participate and everybody can participate in the solution as well, which is the beauty of it. From a confidentiality perspective, what's interesting is it's really not an issue because everyone's <laughs> in the room. Everybody's there, yeah. Right? Uh -huh. um, but I'm aware that in, there are some limitations, like in your side, it, it, there's really some limitations in being able to have everybody in the mm -hmm. room sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where a lot of marriage and family therapists will be in a private setting because they really philosophically believe that they want to treat the whole family, right. that it's not just Joe's issue, right. it's the whole family's right. issue. Right. And so that's a, I think that's why a key difference in someone that's marriage and family therapy, I think sometimes people see the title, oh, you only work with marriages or families. Well, not necessarily. So if Joe did just come in um, and you know, maybe I saw that it made sense to work with, with Joe alone, mm -hmm. I would still consider the family. Right. Probably still have some parent sessions, right. but Joe would then be my client. Right. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we run into situations where someone really does need individuals, still work sure. with the family, or will still work with a married couple, mm -hmm. and yet suggest or help set up a referral for someone who really needs that individual mm -hmm. attention. Have you done that? I have, and I think that's where our, you know, our licenses, our fields can collaborate, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was just thinking it might be a good idea for us to share what we don't do, if you think mm -hmm. about it, you know. I think of one word in particular that we don't do that I think a, a lot of people don't realize. Have you ever had someone come to you and say, tell me what to do? Mm. Give me, tell me, just tell me what to do. <coughs> so think about that for a second, you know. Mm. Is that something that we do? Advice giving. Well, uh, actually the first word that came to my head is what I don't do is I don't judge. Right. Right. So, so we don't judge. So regardless of, of what a client presents with, I, I actually tell people that the more you tell me, that you really don't like about yourself, the more I actually probably like you. Yeah. That, <laughs> Isn't it funny that's how the odd it thing that about way. counselors, yeah. right? That you're going to actually endear me more to you yeah. because I can connect with your struggle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But clients do perceive that their counselor is going to tell them what to do. I, I don't like to be in that position up here. I like to sit with people right. that I don't have your answers, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do my best to help you get to what those answers are for you. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that's similar. Sure. I guess what you said originally made me think um, I, I probably don't do being a spokesperson 
So if you have somebody that comes in for counseling and they say, you know, I want you to tell my wife or yeah. I want you to tell my we child or I want you times, to tell my yeah. mom yeah. that, you know, and all of a sudden now we're the interpreter. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's, that is the first thing that I thought of that I don't do. If, uh -huh. if that's something that you feel mm -hmm. is necessary, then I can help equip you or you be a part of that process that, yeah. or uh -huh. facilitate that. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but, but that would be my first thought. So I wonder if we could just say one word, we're getting close on time here. Um, one of the things that I think about is stigma that's related to counseling and therapy. And you said something really, uh, really great that we don't judge. Right. And I think that a lot of people, when they have an issue, whatever that issue may be, that they need help, often what comes with it is that feeling that they will be stigmatized. Is that something that you are aware of and that you teach, that you're aware of, that you teach, that that's not what we do? Sure. Yeah, I, I think my word would, a lot of what I do is I, I'll normalize. Normalize, yeah. Normalize Good the word. experience for someone that you're, you're not the only one out here. Here's maybe some examples of where other people have struggled and really encourage and validate. I, those are three words, but I think, <laughs> yeah. I think that's where I would put that. Agreed? Yeah, I think for me it would probably be education. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I try to educate in, in this most simplistic way I do that is just by saying um, we don't hold ourselves accountable to fix our cars, to fix our bodies, mm -hmm. or anything else. Why would we hold ourselves accountable to fix our own thoughts without some assistance from others? You guys are amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really are great. It's almost like you've known each other forever. <laughs> I feel like I've known you forever yeah. too. But what, it's been wonderful to have this time with you and to share, you know, the similarities, the differences, and what it is that we do in your particular licenses. So we want to really thank all of you for being here. Mm -hmm. um, we're so glad that you were able to tune in and see our first, our first episode of Psychology Matters. Mm -hmm.